review could be done. It looks like a couple other people asked as well. Um, but just overall, I'm just really interested um, what Lori said about kind of a white person with everything that's going on and allyship and how we can um, do so much better with social justice and you know institutionalized racism and everything that's going on. So I think that was my hope, although I'm sorry I wasn't able to see the morning. It sounded like it was fantastic and I bet it was very informational. So um, just would love to participate this afternoon and, and um, kind of grow my knowledge um, okay. so that I can do my job better. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Cool. All right. I throw it to somebody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see. I see Roxanne Stevens. Cool. Hi. Oh, wait. Am I? Okay, I think I'm muted. Hi, I'm Roxanne Stevens, and I'm from um, California, Bay Area as well. I'm, uh, I've been a social worker for like 30 years, but I'm currently, and I've worked in counties, but currently I'm working as a consultant and um, right, primarily work with our regional training academy, the Bay Area Academy. Um, and so I also was not involved in the morning discussion. And so I'm kind of not, now I'm kind of regretting that I did it. Although the first session that I went to was really informative and was great. Um, so I hope there's a, a, a quick recap of this morning, but I'm excited to be a part of this discussion because I'm actually involved in like, I, I was counting, I think I'm involved in three different kind of formal dialogue um, sessions with with three different groups, including our regional academy and one of the counties that I work for as a consultant, and then another separate group where we're meeting um, on Zoom periodically and we're talking about a lot of the stuff that's happening now and just about how we can come together better and how we can help to support the people that we're working with through these difficult times that, you know, where we're uh, having to confront social justice issues. I'm a Latina, bilingual, bicultural, and I've worked my entire career um, with people of color. And this has been like an ongoing, um, it's been part of uh, like ongoing work my entire adult life. So I'm just glad that we're at this stage in our world where we feel like we have to have this discussion now, but it's been a long time coming. So I'm just glad to be a part of this group. Um, so let's see, I'll take, I'll throw it off to Barbara Neal. I meet myself. Hi. So I'm from Southern California. Um, I'm currently working as a clinical supervisor um, in the city of San Bernardino. What I, I have enjoyed so much, and I don't even know if this is a word, but your um, unapologeticness. <laughs> I love it how you are unapologetic. <laughs> You know, and, and it, because it's something that I need to learn, um, it's, the first session was really emotional for me, even talking about it. Mm. Mm. Okay. I'm turning off my camera. Okay. Understandable. <laughs> okay. Um, you guys can still hear me, right? Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, and it should be. I just need to be more unapologetic. I'm frustrated that we live in a society. I'm glad we're here where we're at today, but I'm just frustrated that we have to do this. As, mm -hmm. as a you know, as black people, we have to fit to defend our blackness. I'm mm -hmm. frustrated that so many people supported Trump. Um, even though he's a blatant racist and he doesn't care about us, because then that means that 70, 000, 70 million people or more don't care either, you know, and we're human beings. And it's just really, I'm just like frustrated mm -hmm. and not trusting of my environment, not trusting of my work environment, just nothing, you know. So I'm just really, really frustrated. 
should say it. I'm angry, you know. Um, I find myself arguing with people, but I'm really I love people too. So on social media, so I don't call names and you know curse and get all crazy. But um, it's just hurtful, you know, to know that you live in a world that is that many people who don't yeah. like you because of the color of your skin. It's really, yeah. And even though, again, I'm glad we're here, we're having this discussion, but I'm angry that we have to have this discussion because we're Black, you know, so mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's yeah. just really Yeah. And I actually have to teach you, I supervise um, unlicensed um, clinicians. And so part of my job is some of them, you know, don't understand the culture. We work in San Bernardino, which is heavily African-American and Latino. Um, or, um, and a lot of them, you know, well, I should say some of the white ones don't understand. And I appreciate them, you know, coming to me and telling me, you know, they, they, they need to learn the culture because they, they work in, in, in this population, but they don't understand it. And so part mm -hmm. of my job is to help them learn. And so when you say it, it's not our job, you know, to educate people on it, that made me feel kind of better because what I do refer them to is to get to know, you know, the people they serve, ask questions, you know, because that's how you show somebody you care that you don't know and you don't understand, ask them, you know, but it is my job that I have to teach people who work with my people and don't understand them and have all these biases. And I appreciate the honesty and I have to help them work through those biases. But it's still that, mm -hmm. you know, on the other end, <laughs> being that Black person that you can have that bias against, you know, it's just really, um, you know, yeah. it's hard and really a difficult time right now, with, especially the ongoing elections. <laughs> it's already over. But anyway, okay, that's my, that's my spiel. Cool. That's Thanks good. for sharing. All right. Uh, let's see. Rebecca Reynolds. Hello. Hi. Uh, hi. I am a project manager with Magellan Healthcare here in the state of Louisiana. Uh, we work with a, a primarily uh, high intensity kids typically low income, poverty. Um, they've had a lot of hospitalizations, a lot of um, multi-state agency involvement, and, and the majority of them are black. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for, we're tr our, the, the population we serve is very small, so it's very difficult to do statistic statistical analysis because you know the population gets very small when you start getting into the population disparities to make sure you know that they're the the appropriate people are getting the information that they need and everything mm -hmm. and so what i really would love to learn more is how can we help these families become empowered in within the, the systems that they're involved with? What's the best way to help them with that, that effort? If that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Who's next? Um, Alicia Bittler. Hi, so I'm Felicia Bittler. I'm a clinical supervisor of clinician and parent support partners within our schools, our systems of care. Um, I work in um, an urban setting, Muskegon, Michigan. Um, and so for me, it's continuing to push um, myself and boundaries and learning more about those youth that we serve. Um, so not only professionally, but also personally, as I do have um, a biracial daughter myself. Um, and we are, um, I say we, as in my daughter and I are primarily surrounded by my white family, right? Um, so I continue to learn not only more about her culture, um, <clears throat> but also the youth that my clinicians serve in continuously educating myself on um, just diversity in general. And then how do I continue um, to 
educate others um, mm-hmm. as the community that we live in, um, family members, all of that are not always supportive and understand all of that. Um, mm-hmm. One example is we are the only one on the block with a Biden sign and a Black Lives Matter flag out front. Mm-hmm. Um, and there has been multiple times in discussions with family members that they just don't quite understand. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess for me, um, you know, just learning all that I can learn, continuing to educate and push those boundaries, um, even when they do get a little tense, you know, how can I do that respectfully too? Um, that's another thing, because it can, can get kind of heated about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Only get that. <laughs> Thank you. What's next? Um... um Let's see, Rick, Deal, you there? You're on mute. I'm gonna get off of mute. Okay. Uh, I was not at this morning, thank you for uh, inviting me or allowing me to come back in the afternoon. Um, I work with the Children's System of Care in New Jersey. So I'm in, that's my dog, Remy, and uh, I'm in Monmouth County, New Jersey. So we work with youth, of all different uh, backgrounds and all different status and, and, and need levels. And um, I'm the quality officer at the agency. So, I mean, I was in the field for years. And at this point, we are taking this time, this pandemic time and this whole strange time that we live in just to kind of go back into our results and outcomes and and looking at all the different systems we work in. Um, we're in courts and schools and hospitals and treatment homes and group homes. And uh, we work with uh, the entire spectrum of needs out there. So we are looking, we are looking deeply into race and ethnicity and gender and um, financial status and things like that, just to kind of make sure that, or maybe root out areas where we where we have our own biases and things that are just that just come into play so this is this is not going away but it's a wonderful it's a wonderful thing to see people from all over the country talking about it so mm-hmm. thank you mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. thank you all right uh, pat moore you want to go <laughs> Um, I'm Pat Moore. I'm the training director for juvenile justice services in the state of Utah. Um, We serve youth from the very front end out in the community where we're trying to to prevent them from coming into the system all the way through our secure facilities where um, we're trying to get them out as fast as we can and with as many skills as as we can to prevent them from coming back in. We've, we've been undergoing reform for the last several years. And as a part of that, we've been looking at race and ethnicity, but of course that's, that's been intensified this year. And I'm, I'm really fortunate to work with the director who has, has really pushed that and made it an even bigger part of our, our system reform. Um, and it is ongoing and, and I'm privileged to be part of it. And, and I'm learning every day. And this is, this is a big piece of that. Thank you for the presentation this morning. Um, and I'm looking forward to the conversation this afternoon. Okay, thank you. All right, who's next? Uh, Dr. Susie Davis, wanna go? Hi, uh, I'm Susie Davis and I am from Southern California where I am a clinical program manager for a community mental health center, and we serve um, primarily Black and Hispanic youth uh, and their families who are either um, DCFS involved or probation involved. So uh, it's an intense group of uh, families that we serve. I was not in the morning uh, session, and I regret that. However, I'm here, uh, and I am, I guess I would say I'm disgusted by the current administration and appalled with some of the decisions that have been made, particularly the decision to separate children. And now we can't find Mm. uh, parents, uh, the parents of 
hundreds mm -hmm. of children. And that is, in, in my opinion, appalling. Mm -hmm. um, but I must say that I am glad that the current administration is here because it has opened the door to this communication to these discussions. And um, I, it, I can't not like that. So I am so grateful that we are now opening our hearts and minds to have the, these kinds of discussions. And I would like to um, learn more ways to move the discussion forward and move the discussion into action plans. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and I will give it to Rhonda Emery. Well, thank you. I am Rhonda Emery, and I am with Southwest in Muskegon County, Michigan. I am a um, clinical manager for our youth service programs. We serve youth who are severely emotionally disturbed in our community mental health system. Um, and I was in this morning's presentation. I really appreciated it, Charlene. I found that as much as I think I understand my implicit biases, every time I get into discussions, I find new ones again, and I get reminded of other ones. And that's really helpful. And it doesn't matter who I'm discussing, racism or differences, um, being a marginalized person, whichever person it is, I do learn. Regardless of my thinking I'm open, I always carry some implicit biases. And I appreciate that. I'm with uh, others. I'm frustrated that as a nation, we're still in this place and we haven't moved further forward. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. All right. Who would you like to throw it to next? I didn't do a good job of keeping track. Um, did Andrew Mangrum go yet? <clears throat> No, hey, this is Andrew Mangrum. I am a clinical program manager for um, an independent living organization. Um, I'm based out of Middle Tennessee. So some of the, yeah, Middle yeah, Tennessee? Yeah. All right. So What's the part? What part? Sorry. I'm in Nashville. Uh, I said that. <laughs> I'm right outside of Dixon. Okay. Down the road. All right. And, um, and I think that, um, first of all, I want to appreciate your transparency and vulnerability in sharing your personal experience um, this morning in, our, in the session that we had. Um, and I think that, um, for me, it's, it's, it's always beneficial to constantly, I guess, lower the plow a little bit deeper um, as we have these conversations to see what about my own biases um, can be unearthed and um, and revealing uh, a bit more about assumptions that um, are automatic um, and uh, need to need to be repented of and so um, I think it's a, a an excellent conversation so thank you so much Thank you. All right. Uh, how about Las Lasagna Williams? Did I get that right? <laughs> you did. Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I had a message pop up. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, my name is Lasagna Williams. I am from South Carolina. I work with the South Carolina Department of Social Services in the Office of Child Health and Wellbeing. Um, and so we are new to the TCOM world. Um, we've had the pleasure of being coached by um, Mark and his team from Tennessee um, and, and others from Tennessee. And so this morning I was in the session about coaching. And so wanted to be in your session, but I had to choose, right? And so coaching was more important as we try to merge into the cans and fast tool. But um, 
I am immediately regretting like everyone else that I didn't hear what <laughs> seems to have been a great presentation. So I'm hoping that it will be available through Socio app that we can pull it up later and watch it at our own convenience. Um, but it's interesting for me to be able to have some conversation and learn about when we're going through the process of coaching our case managers um, and supervisors about using the CANS and FAST tool, how we bring about that culturally responsive attitude and behavior, especially in the current climate that we're in. Yes. We know that when you're one race sitting across the table from another race, that may automatically bring some tension due to what's going on in our culture and our society right now. And then actually being able to coach our staff about how to break down that barrier, because that can be a huge barrier when trying to work with families, you know, um, mm -hmm. with our agency. So just um, thank everybody so far for just having an open mind about this conversation. Because when you see race, you know, you immediately kind of put up your guard a little bit. You don't know what the conversation or the atmosphere is going to be like. But so far, it seems to be welcoming. And so I want to thank everybody, you know, in this group about being open-minded about having this conversation. Because that's how we build bridges, right? When we hear one another and accept what the other person has to say and how they feel, no matter what side you're on, we have to hear one another to have some common ground about how we move forward as a nation. So thank you all. Thank you. Uh, hopefully we're almost done. Who else wants to go? Uh, Juan, you're on camera. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Juan Carlos Yamas. I'm a clinical social worker with, I'm in California, um, with the County of San Bernardino Department of Behavioral Health. And we primarily serve um, young kids, adolescents, uh, persistently, um, you know, severely emotionally disturbed kids, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and primarily serve the Hispanic and, and Black communities as well. And, you know, I, I really, I was in the morning um, session. I really appreciated that conversation, number one, to you know, increase my own self-awareness of my own um, biases, um, but also just to, to learn more about, you know, racial diversity in this country. I'm really saddened about, you know, how divided we are as a country. And so when I um, saw this opportunity to, uh, you know, be a part of this conversation um, this afternoon, but also to learn more about, you know, what Ms. Charlene and all the amazing work that she is doing, you know, in, on the ground uh, to push, forward, um, you know, the, this, this conversation, I thought it was amazing. So thank you, Ms. Charlene, you know, you. Uh, taking the, the time to, to have this conversation with all of us. Appreciate that. You're welcome. All right. Uh, I haven't gone. Sure, go ahead. Hey, um, my name's Amy Kennedy Rickman and I'm in Southern Ohio. I, hello. Um, I am the executive director of a foster care company um, in Ohio and West Virginia. Um, and I think my, my life is so fast paced and I'm kind of in a bubble just dealing with child welfare and the safety of kids. Um, I don't think I've ever slowed down to pay attention to what was going on. So this year has really been a year of self-exploration for me and learning kind of the difference between not being racist and anti-racism and sorry I'm echoing um but it's it's really been a time for me to jump in and learn everything I can about what's going on in our country and how to be a better ally and use my voice um, I've never considered myself privileged before, but I had somebody tell me that this year, that simply by being white, that that is a form of privilege um, and that I should use that in more of an ally way. Um, so just trying to learn as much as I can. And your, um, your talk this morning was incredible. Thank you so much for that. But I'm just here to learn as much as I can and try to bring that to my kids and my families. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, Lauren Coleman, did you, did you go? Okay. Go ahead. No. Hi. 
Uh, my name is Lauren Coleman. I am a training manager um, for a, in the Institute for Innovation and Implementation at the University of Maryland School of Social Work. So we're in Baltimore. Um, and my uh, area is workforce development and support um, for Maryland. Although the Institute, we have a lot of national and local work. Um, I really regret not attending your lecture this morning and I will be watching that <laughs> recording, um, but the coaching one was good too. Um, I mean, I just echo everything everyone has said, you know, really resonates with me. Um, and so of course this is relevant for me pushing myself to take into action the things that I need to do as a white person in this country, um, as well as at, my in my position at my job, part of our um, equity and social justice committee is to push our institution to becoming an anti-racist institution um, internally and as, you know, uh, partners in con consulting and workforce development with partnering agencies and states and institutions as well. We kind of see ourselves as like, we need to pilot internally how we push ourselves to grow um, and address systemic racism in child welfare, in these systems, in universities, et cetera, um, so that we can push that out to the work we do outside of ourselves as well, if that makes sense. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think we're almost done. I see, uh, I don't. I hope I get this right. Laysa, Laysa. La <laughs> you Jameson. got it. Okay. It's my name is Laysa Jameson. Um, so I am from Southern California. I work in San Bernardino County, um, Department of Behavioral Health, and I'm one of the lead clinicians for our um, children's unit. So um, my unit, I work with Carlos. Um, so we work with you know uh, foster youth who need intensive case management services, um, who've been moved around a lot in the county or outside of the county, who have um, high, uh, who are at high risk for hospitalization or, or just um, we kind of the frequent flyers of the county. I guess you can say the ones that use utilize the services a lot, trying to problem solve on how to address their barriers to services. Um, and I think um, I'm just wanted to be here to just um, learn more and trying to, I felt like growing up, I lived in a bubble and I've been told that since I've worked in this county. Um, I grew up predominantly around in the Asian community and I came to America when I was nine. Um, and even then coming here, living in Southern California, Los Angeles, um, I was just, didn't really know much um, outside of, you know, the Asian community. So just wanting to learn more to understand um, how to work with our clients, um, and their families and, um, you know, and how to help myself because I've always grown up um, thinking I don't see color and I've come to learn mm -hmm. it's not something that I should think about and just kind of change that mindset and really understanding what that means. So just really want to educate myself and um, kind of change the perspective that I've grown up with. Mm, okay. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth Aguilar. You want to go? Hi. Yes, I'm Elizabeth Aguilar. I work with uh, Lisa and um, and Juan Carlos. So we work in uh, Southern California, San Bernardino County, uh, with um, high level needs uh, youth, um, usually system involved uh, with children and family services or probation, or children just with really high needs um, that are in the hospitals. Um, I missed the uh, first part. Uh, to be honest, I was confused on the time because we're in Southern California. So in my head, I had that other training at eight and this one at 11. So um, I'm sorry I missed out. It looks like I missed out really important material. Um, but I'm glad that we're having the discussion. And, um, you know, just to, I know somebody else said this, but um, I'm glad that even though all these things have happened over this last year, I feel like it's been a year of reflection and it's open um, the opportunity for us to discuss the, um, you know, systemic racism and discrimination more openly. So um, that's one of the things that I'm grateful for out of all of the, you know, just tragedies and, and all these things that have occurred over, especially highlighted this year. Um, 
And I'm looking forward to learning uh, more ways how I can support my, uh, my youth uh, that I work with and, and just grow in, in my knowledge on, on ways that I can be more, uh, you know, less biased and just be more supportive and, and, um, and meet their needs. Yeah. All right. Um, maybe one more. Um, Mary, Mary Elise. <laughs> I don't want to get your name wrong. <laughs> yes, it's Maria Lisa. Um, but mm. I usually just go by Maria. But thank you, Charlene. Um, hi okay. everyone. I I also am from Southern California. I work alongside with uh, Elizabeth and Lisa and Juan Carlos uh, in San Bernardino County's Department of Behavioral Health. Um, and I want to thank you for your morning uh, presentation. It was very powerful and impacting. And I, I knew I wanted to sign up for this, not just to learn and grow professionally, um, but as a Latina woman myself, um, a double minority of being able to, to learn about other biases and even in our own cultures that we sometimes, you know, put aside mm -hmm. and don't recognize. And also as a mother, you know, I now am going to be teaching my daughter about some of these, you know, biases and the things going on in the world. And I really want to be able to have all that knowledge to be able to, to guide her in a way that she as well as she's growing up can learn her own biases, but also mm -hmm. be mindful of the biases that are going around. So I thank you for this morning. It was very powerful. Thank you. Cool, cool. All right, so I, has everyone gone that wants to go? Speak now forever, hold your peace. All right, so I'll do a little recap since I still have my PowerPoint open. <laughs> Hopefully I, I can get long winded. So let me, I will try to breeze through some of the slides um, and I can share these. Um, I'll go back and hopefully they'll share it at the end of the conference. Let me share my screen real quick. A lot of folks from California. All right. Okay. Cool. So um, just real quick, I talked about, um, really touched on systemic racism, but I, I did it from the lens of the work that I do in Tennessee. Uh, so the organization that I founded four years ago, a week after the Trump election was, um, it's called the Equity Alliance. And um, it was really at a moment where I was having my own sort of political wake awakening in the wake of Trayvon Martin being killed um, two days after my son being born and realizing like seeing the injustice could, could be, couldn't come to my doorstep by having a black son and feeling like we are like endangered species out here just getting picked off by the police. And um, I felt like, I just felt this inner compelled compelled feeling of doing something like I couldn't sit back any longer and just watch this happen and watch the news and seeing the uprising in Ferguson and I not be there and not in it and um, I'm a spiritual person I believe in God I'm a Christian and so I feel like I have a moral duty a righteous duty to look after the least of these and go after justice because that's what Jesus would want so um, don't mean if any of I have no one's of the Christian faith, but that's what I believe. And um, so I did a little bit about me, native of Little Rock, Arkansas, grew up single parent home, uh, got to Tennessee because I went to Vanderbilt and uh, went on almost a full ride scholarship, not even realizing I could get accepted to Tennessee and uh, excuse me, to Vanderbilt. Um, and being smart, no one really poured into me saying I was smart, uh, but I got into all the elite schools that I applied for and Vanderbilt gave me the most money and that's where I went. So um, I got my master's in public administration with a concentration in nonprofit management because at the end of my four years at Vandy, realized that um, social service work, nonprofit work was what I wanted to do, but I quickly realized that it's 
uh, I was wrestling with this um, notion of charity versus justice. And it wasn't enough for me to just be out here in a nonprofit space serving clients, which is fine, which is cool to do the direct service part. But how do I get at the root causes of some of these issues that we're facing um, in our work? Uh, why do people need, you know, extra supports for housing and mental health? Why is it that um, some people are suffering more than others? Why is it that our public school systems in some areas of town are um, less funded than others? And I just wanted to get at the systemic causes. And so the Equity Alliance was born in 2016 after Trump got elected. And uh, we really, I just channeled that anger. I called together five other Black women and Black women get it done. I mean, I it just is what it is. I mean, as you saw in this election, like we we answered the call of duty and um, they they latched on to my idea of wanting to start this organization. So we did that. And with the idea of meeting people where they are right here to and when we drill that down. In, in terms of how do we empower folks to feel like they have a voice? Um, how do we get at building political power so that we have influence over the decisions being made about our lives, we drill that down to, it, it, it all comes down to voting. It all comes down to the vote. And when we talk about equity in this country, the one place we are all equal, whether you black, white, Latina, Muslim, you know, LGBTQ, whatever, we all have one vote. Bill Gates has a vote, Donald Trump got one vote, and I got one vote. And we all equal right there in the ballot box. So when it comes to who's going to win, if I get my people out more than you, then I'm going to win. So that's that's how we look at it uh, with the Equity Alliance. And so we, we're a 501c3. We do work all around statewide in Tennessee. We're here trying to combat the system from from the way of voter suppression. So we try to attack the system from removing those barriers that plague particularly um, minority communities around voter suppression. Um, but we also do other work, as we have seen in the pandemic. We've had to do a lot of work around. Um, we did an initiative called Don't Sell Out North, uh, where we had a tornado come through Nashville and rip through the predominantly black part of town. We mobilized, we fed folks, we cleaned up the area, we put checks in people's hands, and we organized these homeowner meetings because gentrification is running rampant in Nashville. And we wanted to encourage homeowners to not sell their homes. So hashtag don't sell out North was our calling signal to say, don't sell your home because you actually have value in your home. And by selling it, you're giving up that um, piece of your, your American dream. Um, another thing we did was our fair share, which was um, to say to the city government, we want our share, our fair share of COVID resources. Um, Nashville got $121 million in federal CARES Act money back in March. And we were there to be the voice to say, Black and Latino communities are suffering the most. We're dying um, three times the rate and we deserve the money. Like put the money literally in people's hands because people are getting evicted, they're getting laid off. And as a result of um, our community needs assessment, the Metro City Council approved $10 million for, to go towards mortgage rent and utility assistance for Nashvillians and $5 million for um, minority small businesses. So um, as a direct result of the leverage and political power, we were able to garner um, by speaking up. And then we also had to sue the state to make sure every every Tennessean could vote by mail in this election, where in normal elections, it's, it's about 2% that submits an absentee ballot. Um, that went up drastically in this election. And thanks to our lawsuit, we were able to win and allow to remove that barrier for people who normally wouldn't have the access to vote absentee. We also did a lot for this upcoming election. We call it the Tennessee Black Voter Project. We reached over 400,000 folks. We mobilized, we registered voters. Um, we saw record turnout in Tennessee and we pride ourselves on going to where the people are. Um, this is not a, a spectator sport. Um, democracy is not, we don't call it participatory democracy for nothing. You have to participate and go to where the people are and grab them and bring them into the process. And that's what we do. So that's some of the work. But um, three takeaways from this morning was one, 
know the problem, know what we're dealing with here and what systemic uh, racism looks like. And we have to know our history in order to do that, secondly. And then thirdly, know our role and how we can um, play a part in being the solution. Um, so obviously, we're in three pandemics, not just one. And people don't realize that, but they, they all go together. The first one being the pandemic of white supremacy that marginalized people, particularly Black people, have been dealing with since you know, since we got here um, on slave ships is having to be treated as second class citizens. And then the pandemic of poverty where um, our community is always at the bottom when it comes to every social and economic indicator. Um, and when you put all those, those two together, you get the third one, which made all of those issues even worse, which is COVID. And it flipped um, every issue on its head and exposed all of the social ills that, are, that you all as uh, practitioners are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, so this is not a normal year. If, it did, if, if you feel like you've been working harder than ever before, it, this is why, because you're literally working through three pandemics. Uh, at least I know I have. I, I haven't had a day off since March 3rd, since that tornado hit. So um, that's what we've been doing. <clears throat> I showed a video of Amy Coney Barrett and how she um, described her children. I'll put that clip um, in the chat so you can watch later. I also talked about all the different types of racism. There's individual racism on um, just what we believe and the attitudes and the preconceived notions and stereotypes that we have about uh, and othering other people. And then there's the interpersonal racism that can be a little bit more blatant where you calling people racial slurs. Um, you know, you have, uh, and it's, it's person to person in between individuals. And then there's institutional racism that exists within an organization by way of different policies, um, HR practices, uh, how you promote and hire, how, how people get selected for different boards and commissions and task forces. All of those things play into institutional racism. And then it's the overarching system that is structural that we have to all play a part in dismantling um, that really what I talked about. So, and then knowing your history, and I won't go into all these, but um, there's a, about six areas where systemic racism really is prevalent. And all of those play touch and in, in, are interconnected, if I should say. Uh, you have housing, education, um, the criminal justice system and policing, uh, the gener how we build generational wealth in this country, um, our healthcare system, and then our democracy. All of these different areas are interconnected and um, show up, but the one common theme is public policy. Um, how uh, public policy is, is, it, is where um, the systemic racism shows up and we have to be able to like recognize it and see it. Um, and, and, and that's where you get the unintended consequences and the, uh, the inequities and health disparities and the racial wealth gap because of policies have been set up and designed to advantage um, white people and put them on a, a, a playing field where they have um, advantages. They're given the benefit of doubt when it comes to home ownership, when it comes to accessing capital to start a business. Um, just by sheer being white, you're given the benefit of the doubt that you aren't um, all these things. And then the others, all of the other folks are, are, are not given the benefit, the benefit of the doubt. And there's all these hoops we have to jump through in order to access the same opportunities that typically white people do. So I will um, fast forward through all that. And then lastly, knowing your role um, and knowing actually what equity is. Um, I, talk, I talked about equity um, and what how's that, how that is different from equality. Um, here in Nashville, we have this problem really, really bad. Uh, we like to throw around the term equity, but it truly, they, they, what they're thinking is actually equality. And uh, we don't want equality. Like we don't, actually want the same resources to be spread out across we in my definition of equity it's putting resources where they are most needed um, and so to get to equity um, sometimes that means this dude on the right is going to be uh 
have have two two uh, boxes to stand on versus the guy on the left. He doesn't need any, right? Um, that doesn't mean he's any less capable, any less uh, deserving of resources. It just means he has everything he needs. He's good, but this extra, this other person might just need some extra supports, and it's okay. We have to be okay with um, letting go of that resource and power, um, letting go of our power so that someone else can, we can share in that. But what we often miss in this um, pursuit of equity is liberation. And we have to just break down the damn fence altogether. Like we have to reprogram and retool our minds to think that we don't have to operate in the system that has been given to us. We can change it. Like we have the power to actually rewrite the rules. And as um, folks who work in government, sometimes I might not feel like it, but you might, you have power, you have a voice and you're there to advocate on behalf of the people that you're seeing every single day um, and the children that you're seeing. So um, in terms of knowing your role, uh, what I would like to get across to you is being, it's, it's one thing to say, okay, I'm not racist, but that's on an individual level, right? In order for us to get to ending um, anti-Black racism, it's, <clears throat> we have to play a part in the larger system and it's going to take all of us. So having to commit to being anti-racist. So actually working against racism. And that means having to sometimes have the difficult conversations, having to confront um, people who you normally would not have to speak up. Sometimes it's speaking up in the workplace and asking the tough questions and challenging, well, why are we doing it that way? Um, or challenging your cousins <laughs> at the at the Thanksgiving dinner table on, you know what, that joke was not appropriate um, and, and doing that work. But we have to do the work. But it, it starts with acknowledging it and telling the truth and, and acknowledging that it actually exists. Um, that's, that's probably one of the biggest hurdles. Um, you know, there's this... Um, hierarchy and I forget the name of it it's a uh, it's it's called white white race theory uh, I can send you a link but there's this uh, spectrum or continuum of how white people travel on this continuum of being anti-racist and um, a lot of people stop at the level of shame and guilt uh, because they're they're ashamed of their race I, I hear that all the time I'm so ashamed of my people um, I'm, I feel so guilty and uh, and we're just gonna throw money at the problem without doing the work and I, I challenge you to yes we need money <laughs> absolutely uh, we will take your donation but also do the work of um, working on yourselves and doing the internal um, heart to heart that is needed um, to dismantle this this uh, racism system. So uh, these are some recommended readings, and I'll leave that there for just a second. Uh, is that's how I ended it? Is just if you want to go deeper, I challenge you to grab some of these books or audio books, um, watch some of these documentaries. It's these are some of my favorites. There's obviously tons and tons of books out there, but these are some that I personally can vouch for and are currently reading. Uh, the, if you don't do anything, uh, read the 1619 Project. It's so well-written and well-researched um, and touches on a lot of the, the six uh, circles that I had around how we got to where we are today and co really connects the dots. So um, I'll leave with that. So that's my long recap or short recap rather on that. All right, so uh, thoughts, reactions, questions. No, okay. Um, is, uh, where is she? Is she still on here? Oh yeah, she's on here, Barbara Neal. I, I wanted to go back to your comment about being more unapologetic and having to defend your blackness. I, I wholeheartedly um, understand where you're coming from. And, and me starting the Equity Alliance is very much part of my personal journey uh, to, to self-healing 
And, um, I, you know, I, I experienced a lot of ACEs as a child, um, adverse childhood experiences. I probably needed a caseworker when I was younger, honestly. Um, and I was able to persevere. But I grew up really quiet and shy as a kid. Um, I didn't talk a lot. I was afraid of adults. And uh, now I just feel so empowered to just say what the hell I want to say. <laughs> Who gonna check me? You know, it's, it's that kind of feeling because now I, I've been enlightened to um, how the system works. And I just want to encourage you to, to just walk more in feeling empowered um, and teaching. It's okay to teach people. I'm just personally not, I'm, I'm, I'm not there anymore. I, I used to feel like I needed to teach people, but from my perspective, it's, it's, I've had to navigate a world for 38 years and no one taught me how to navigate whiteness. No one taught me how to uh, be the only black woman in my workplace. I went to Vanderbilt <laughs> University, a pre predominantly white institution. And I remember, cause I grew up poor. I remember my freshman year walking. There's a lot of pathways on Vanderbilt's campus, beautiful campus. And there's these narrow sidewalks that take you to all the different buildings. And I remember always just walking like with a chip on my shoulder because it metaphorically meant like I belong here. Like I earned my right to be here, but folks would make me feel like I didn't. Um, I was always the outsider because one, I couldn't afford on my own to buy my tuition to go to Vanderbilt, but I know I was smart enough and on the merits to be there. I, you know, I didn't have a trust book, trust fund or my dad couldn't make a phone call to get me in. And that's how privilege shows up. And I knew I was going to school with folks like that, but I just felt like, Nah, like I deserve to be here and I'm not moving off the sidewalk. Like literally I would see groups of folks walking toward me and I'm like, I'm not moving off the sidewalk because I belong here. <laughs> and uh, so I just, I don't know where I was going with that, but um, you know, I just feel like teaching, I've had to navigate these spaces and no one taught me how to do that. And so we have to let others find that journey for themselves and be ready for it. Like it's, we can't force it, but let them be ready for it. Yes. Educate. Yes. Let's correct. I, I will correct you in a heartbeat. Yes. Um, but don't, I don't want to spoon feed something to folks that aren't ready for it. That makes sense. <laughs> uh, reactions. Don't let me just do all the talking y'all. <laughs> um, what I would else? love to jump in. Oh, okay. <laughs> I would love to jump in there on that. Um, okay. it kind of, it struck me earlier when you said that about not wanting, not feeling the necessity to teach. And, you know, as, as a white person, I mean, this is, this is what I wear. And so I think the assumption is made that I'm not open to learning sometimes, but I don't want to hear what other people's perspectives are, what their culture brings to them. And um, it, it's kind of hurtful for me to not, not have an opportunity to ask, to be afraid to ask, or mm -hmm. to be afraid to learn, change my perspective. Um, I have to hear it or I can't, I can't change. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, not being afraid to ask. Yeah, you, should, you shouldn't be afraid to ask. Um, I would agree with that, yeah. But if you're asking, if you're asking, then you're, you're willing to learn. You're, you're, you're on the path of finding the journey, like you said, for yourself, right, Charlene? I mean, mm -hmm. if you're- mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah. How, I, I, how do you get the reaction back if she is asking that you're willing to drop some knowledge because she's asking? I mean, is there a middle path there? Um, I guess it depends. And I guess you would have to gauge the context of whatever conversation you're having and who you're, who you're engaging in that conversation with. Um, 
if if that person is willing to share and and allow you to ask that question, sure. Um, but some just know that there are folks who may not be as receptive to entertaining that emotional labor, um, so to speak. And um, and we should allow that grace to, but I totally like, I guess you just kind of have to fill out yeah. where, who, you know, who you're engaging with and whether it's, it's that appropriate and how you ask it, you know, um, sometimes it can feel like, um, you know, someone's asking me from a place of, um, okay, are you really truly wanting to learn or are you just, I don't know. It's it's hard to explain. I guess so, like, this is what's on you. Oh, mm-hmm. I was gonna say, do you agree that because it matters who you ask, right? First of all, it matters mm-hmm. who you ask, right? And then, of course, what is the question? Because you wouldn't just go to any source if you wanted to be educated, right? Right. This is true. So this you want to make sure you educate yourself, right? Have some common base of understanding. And then you become more knowledgeable to engage in meaningful conversation with someone you know, right? Mm -hmm. Because not everybody can teach you about racism, right? And because there are a lot of black people who don't know it, right? We just live it. We don't know why (laughs) this, right? We need to educate ourselves in our own history to know how we got here and why we're still here in 2020, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't have a responsibility to teach every person in my circle, whether black or white or, or, or other. But we can have conversations about how we feel about what's happening. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So if you want to learn the root cause, you're going to have to educate yourself. And then like being a part of the conversation with someone like Charlene, who has educated herself to have meaningful conversations with us, that makes a difference. So you wouldn't just ask anybody you saw in a grocery store, you know, or the local lady you see every week at the library, right? Yeah. You to educate yourself about the root causes and then come from a sense of a place of your own understanding and what you've lived and then apply it. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Everybody's experience is different, right? Absolutely. Everybody's experience is different. Yeah. Yes. Well, let's well tell put, you, let's tell you, I did I think that's well articulated. And, and in, a, in addition to yes. doing the work and educating yeah. yourself, I think what you're getting at is find an appropriate cultural guide or someone who's willing to engage and to go into those difficult conversations. And as a Black woman, one of the things that is very important to me in having those conversations, that we are engaging on equal, <coughs> excuse me, equal turf where I'm not being put under a microscope or where my interviewer is not uh, coming in a, a, a stance of uh, superiority or where they're being entertained uh, in finding out about my history or who I am as a person. Right. Um, not being made to feel like we're like the spokesperson for all Black folks. Like that's where I'm trying to get at. Like that's where it kind of can feel a bit condescending. But if you're trying to ask genuinely from a place of understanding maybe something personally about me and wanting to know something, then that's different. I agree. Oh, excuse me. Can I just um, chime in? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go I wait. just want to chime in from a perspective of a Latina woman. Um, for me, so hearing this conversation, here's where I come from, because as I said in my introduction, I've been doing work around, um, you know, equity for for families of color, primarily um, immigrants, um, uh, Mexican, um, uh, Mexican, primarily Mexican, but immigrants in general, and then obviously other people of color. And it's been 30 years. And I and as I said, I've been um, engaging in various dialogues. I have like three kind of formal dialogues that I'm engaged in right now. And honestly, it feels like we're having the same conversations that I had, you know, 25 years ago. And when I was in my 20s, I was excited. And I was like, yes, I love these conversations. And then you kind of get tired of saying the same things. Like, haven't you been listening to what we've been saying for Mm -hmm. for me, you know, from my point of view for 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what's hard. So I would, so... I, I feel like I, I take up a different space because I am, first of all, Latina and I'm light-skinned, which in ways it, it creates 
a lot of different issues for me because people may automatically assume that I'm a Caucasian and then, but once I start to speak, then it's pretty clear that I'm not, but I, I kind of have, I, I kind of have that thing that I, that I deal with a lot. And then I get really frustrated because then people get offended by me because then I call them on stuff and they're like, Oh, wait a minute. I thought you were with us. And that gets really old and tiring too. So I think that what I would say, this is my own suggestion is I would just say, just go with it. And, and, and just understand that sometimes just people are just tired of having the same conversation over and over and talking about the same thing over and over. I would suggest, and this is what I, this is what I liked about what you're doing, Charlene, in your work, is that you, that you put kind of your words into actions or as you learn, learn through your actions. Because if you're out there, boots on the ground, you're going to learn. And it's yeah. not even really about learning, honestly. I think it's more about opening your heart and then and questioning and checking your own in, inner thoughts. So if you see a person of color and you feel a reaction to what they're saying or what they're doing, then I would like check it, check myself. Like, why am I feeling that about what that person just did or said? And see if it's coming from a place of bias. But I think when you're a boots on the ground doing the work, it's it's easier to have to learn about that. The other thing that I just wanted to add, Charlene, I just wanted to say that I love what your project is doing because I think that people of color, part of what I think we have to reconcile through this mm -hmm. whole effort is that we have to stop waiting for people to give us the opportunity to do what we're doing. And we have to do it for ourselves because yeah. I get frustrated I, and I am really frustrated after all these years of trying to advocate for families, especially in the child welfare system and in the juvenile probation system for more mm -hmm. services, for more, you know, financial supports. Like I, I because it always feels like we're at the mercy of everybody else mm -hmm. and we have that for ourselves, right? And so what I'm, what I'm hoping to do now that I'm kind of older and I'm um, in, a, in a different situ place in my life where I have a little bit more choice about what I do with my work and myself is really like working to advocate economic um, lifting people up economically, lifting people up socially. And then of course, like what you guys are doing about, you know, around, um, around political arenas in our, in the little town that I live in, we've elected like a record number Latinos and uh, women and people, LGBTQ people. We don't, we don't have a large African-American community here, but we do have a, a few elected officials that are Latin, I'm sorry, that are African-American. And I think that that's where we have to come from rather than within the systems. I think that we're, losing, we're, we're um, fighting a losing battle within the systems because they're set up in a way that leaves us always vulnerable, mm -hmm. leaves us asking for, uh, a system that is it there it's based on white supremacy because it comes from a, a le, it comes from a foundation of, of of a country that's white and it does not come from a foundation of people mm -hmm. of color and if we're constantly battling within the system and not looking out how we lift each other up or how we change what's happening outside of the system i just feel like we're going to continue to have like i said earlier these same conversations, these same complaints that we've had for years and years and years, because we are at the mercy of other people rather than having the power ourselves, economically, politically, socially, all of that. And I, so I love what you guys are doing and I'm really happy to hear this conversation. And I, yeah, so anyway, I'm real excited yeah. now because <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, feeling like I'm hearing stuff that makes a lot more sense than some of the conversations that we've had for so many years. So I'm gonna stop yeah. now. Yeah, I like what you said about um, not feeling feeling like the system is not set up for us. Um, I remember when I worked for um, the Tennessee Department of Human Services, I was, you know, a caseworker and I just kept feeling like, you know, the TANF program is not set up in a way that really, truly, they, they say it's supposed to get people on a path to self-sufficiency but it's, it doesn't because it rewards um, single mothers who, you know, have to put their significant other on child support, at least in here in Tennessee, you have to report your, the father of your child in order to get welfare. And it's like, it doesn't set up 
for someone to have a thriving two-parent household and still get assistance. It's like it's set up for us to have to choose. And I don't ever think that has ever was designed to put families first, uh, which is what the program was called, Families First. Um, it doesn't. It's, it's designed to split up families um, in that way. Same with uh, housing. Like you can't, public housing, you have to, you can't be, is it, is it I don't want to misquote, but I believe here you have to uh, report uh, a significant other living in your home that's not married to you or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I just feel like some of the rules just aren't written in such a way that really actually sets us up for success. And then, but then I think about, well, how do I change that? And I just keep going back to the vote. Like we have to change people who will put policies in place that will help us change that. Mm. Hmm. Okay. Um, and truly friendly. Okay. Great discussion. Um, how to help people feel empowered? Maybe y'all can help me with that one. <laughs> how do we help our the people who come to us every day feel feel like they have hope? Um, out of their situation. So I'll just say this. I'm just going to say this one, one thing. I think that when they see people like you that have um, overcome incredible obstacles, and I think most of us that, that come from like poor families, like I was raised by a single mother, had an alcoholic father who, you know, was abusive and all that. So I came from that kind of a home. We had to leave our state of Texas to California to uh, get away from the abuse and we were here by ourselves and with all of that I had a really strong mother who who helped me to to have confidence in myself and learn that I can get educated and I can do something with my life I think that gives a lot of people hope so what you did and then and then speaking about it and putting it out there it gives the uh, at least for me that I'm like in the older generation um, you know, my kids, my grandkids, a lot of hope. And then the people that I interact with, my nieces, my nephews, my friends, all of them, I think that gives a lot of hope because mm -hmm. people can see that there is a pathway. So, and then yeah. just quickly about the election, having Kamala Harris in that yes. position. It, Absolutely. It like breaks mm -hmm. all the glass. And I mean, not all of it, but it helps in a lot of ways. So that's one way for sure. Absolutely. I agree with that. Um, representation definitely matters. We, how do we, how can we see, how can we believe something, believe for something if we don't ever see it happen? If I, if I'm living in, you know, housing project and I never see one, anybody make it out with my, you know, my, my homies getting shot up all the time. Where's the hope for me? You know, um, yeah, like we have to be the change and show it. And so that's my small way and my contribution to the world is that I hope that people see that everyday people, like just everyday regular folks, I'm just a, a, someone who saw a need and filled it, can actually do something and have power to change their situation. And so I just hope that we can all lean into like being the change um, that we want to see. And you may be the only light that that person sees in their week. Be their light. Um, and that goes back to someone talked about having culturally responsive attitudes. Um, yeah, we. I hope that no one on this call is approaching their work from a sense of like, it's a chore or this, oh, I have to see these cases today. Um, and even maybe decolonizing our minds to not refer to people as cases. Um, like, let's not do that because that diminishes their humanity and only, you know, only shows them as a transactional uh, deliverable. And so, um, yeah, we have to have a culturally responsive um, attitude towards um, how people show up. And that goes back to a white supremacy mindset too. When Barbara told me about the whole being unapologetic, um, it is a struggle. I struggle with imposter syndrome, uh, full transparency, because 
the world t tells me that I'm only supposed to be a certain way, act a certain way, carry myself a certain way, talk a certain way. I'm supposed to talk white. I'm supposed to talk like this. I'm supposed to be professional. And that is a white supremacist mindset, honestly. Um, to and so for people, for Black people to show up in a in their authentic authentic selves in the workplace with my hair looking like this, and and I don't have to wear a suit every day. Like we have to change our mindset around what we can deem. Uh, what we deem as professional and appropriate uh, going back to the culturally responsive attitude and like not shaming people for how they show up as themselves. Um, I had, a, I had somebody tell me like, cause again, we're, we're a young organization. We're still considered a, a nonprofit startup. And so everything's not in a row. Like all our organization processes aren't in place all the time. And, uh, sometimes how we run our board meetings are not the traditional nonprofit way. And I had somebody tell me like, well, th um, we needed to be more professional. And uh, what did she say? Oh, that's just not good enough for me. When I um, told her, like, I'm doing the best that I can to carry this organization. <laughs> and I'll never forget. And I'll just, and this is, was a white woman who told me this. And not, it was this year, actually. And I'll never forget it because I'm just like, how dare you, um, you know, tell me what's not good enough for you <laughs> for an organization that I built. You know what I'm saying? So uh, that was not a culturally uh, sensitive, appropriate response for her. So. <laughs> Any, um, anything else? One of the, oh, sorry. sorry, one of the things that I keep coming back to is is the those words that you said earlier, Charlene, um, emotional labor. And and I feel like that's a part of educating myself is that I have to take on the emotional labor. I have to be willing to step up and learn what I don't know and be willing to ask the hard questions and be willing to be vulnerable and and to mm -hmm. my friends that are people of color to be able to say, I didn't know, <laughs> or um, what, what, what am I doing that's offensive or, or how can I get better and, and being open to the feedback, right? Yeah. Like it really is about me taking on the emotional labor and, and yes, I'm going to have to ask questions and I'm going to have to, to ask them to help me with some of that, but I'm not asking mm -hmm. them to educate me. I'm asking them to allow me to be vulnerable and to take on that emotional labor and, and help become equals in, in that work together. Um, yeah. and, it, and it's hard and it's, and, and it's, but it's time for us to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. You said it right there. That's it. It's, we, there's a whole Ted talk, um, that, uh, is on that topic of being, getting comfortable with un, being uncomfortable. And, um, that's it. Like we have to just start, being uncomfortable with um being vulnerable and pushing through yeah. that's that was good mm -hmm. i guess one thing in terms of like kind of going back to Lori's question and i in no way have had like anywhere near an experience of a person of color right um but i shared i do have a biracial daughter um i have learned a great deal about her hair um that has been a huge task for me um and i've had to ask those questions right and so for me to ask those questions, um, I have learned it all depends on context, right? Because if I'm just asking you, Charlene, about your hair, right? Mm -hmm. I'm asking about your hair. You're going to look at me like, why are you asking all these questions about my hair, right? <laughs> Am I just asking about your hair for like my own knowledge of like, I, I don't know nothing about your hair. I'm just asking, right? Mm -hmm. But if I'm asking you in terms of hey, I have a daughter, you know, and I'm looking for products or what is this product for? Or because there's a, there's a million different products for different things that I don't know because I never use products like that. So I think right. one of it, it was the meaningful conversation, right? What is the meaning behind it? And also what is your intention from this conversation? Is it for your own personal gain just to be like, I'm curious about her hair. So I'm asking, or is mm -hmm. it to really understand more about Charlene? Is it more to understand about that person of color? Or is it just because I don't know, I'm just asking because it's something I don't know. Does that make sense? Um, 
Yeah, there's a yeah, that's a good contrast. Like, yeah, I've had people ask me about my hair and wanting to touch it. And it's like, no, you can't touch my hair. <laughs> uh, but if you're asking from a place of like, I need to understand because I have a daughter and like, yeah, you probably know more about black hair care products than I do, then that's different. Yeah, for sure. And even so, that would be a little bit of a stretch because her hair, her, te- her hair texture is different than yours, right? But, yeah, yeah. You know, but yeah, that's just mm-hmm. one example. It's all in, yeah, it's all in context. Into that a little bit, so. Yep. It's all in context, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I just want to ask, Charlene, um, did you or, or anyone else on the panel, I don't know if you watched the show, This Is Us, but there, um, if you haven't watched it, try to catch it. Um, that that's right. episode was just absolutely amazing. It really? talked about people apologizing for things that happened to other races. It's like, mm. why do you feel the need to apologize to me for what may have happened to George Floyd, right? Mm. And I won't give it away, but if you go back and watch it, it's just, it just brings to mind the fact that we go through life sometimes, day in, day out, work with one another. But when we don't talk about race, we don't talk about those hard topics. And then it's like, we just kind of just shy away from it. And then when something major happens, it's like, oh, do I talk about the election? Do I say anything? <laughs> That's who she voted for. That's what I didn't know that we just had a major election and Joe Biden's possibly has won and Trump's fighting it. You know, we don't mm-hmm. talk about it, right? Because I'll yeah. be honest with you, as people were introducing themselves and people, I think Barbara was talking about the way she felt. I think Lisa shared about the way she felt. I was like, ooh, are we gonna go there today? Are we gonna talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just kind of cower away from it. So I think we all have that in us, especially if we're professionals, you know, you kind of want to keep it even keel, but it just brings to mind how it is important for us to have those conversations in a respectful manner so that we can break down that barrier, right? Because that's what divides us, not talking about it. Yeah. Exactly like it's this imaginary thing. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, in doing so with some of my other colleagues, I do recognize that there is a place of genuine ignorance or lack of knowledge. And that's okay. We as black people have to be okay with that mm-hmm. because it doesn't make them wrong. It just means they're uninformed, right? Mm-hmm. And so we have to accept that too, that there are, you know, you can't like people can't look at me and call me anything. I can't look at you and call you anything. We have to actually talk to each other and then I can form an opinion, right? Based on mm-hmm. some conversations and some interactions with you, but not just because I look at you, right? And so I think it kind of goes both ways. It, to me, it goes both ways. Yeah. But, but if you yeah. watch the episode, you'll be enlightened is what I'm talking about more about how you can really have a best friend or a colleague and stuff and never talk about the hard topics until something major happens. Then the question becomes, well, why are you talking about it now? Yeah, well, I didn't know you felt like that, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, well, I got a lot of catching up to do because I haven't watched This Is Us since season one, I think episode like eight, <laughs> I just stopped. I couldn't keep up. I, I don't have time to watch TV as much as no, I do. Yeah, no, I, gotta, I gotta catch that Black one. Girl raised with, you know, two um, um, white individuals as triplets and how to go. Yes. Yeah, so it, it's just, it's really good, really good. Nice, nice. Okay, I guess that. But no, you you spot on with that. Um, can, I, can I ask a question? Mm-hmm. And so maybe this is again. This is. I feel like this is a risky question to ask because it does demonstrate my ignorance. Going back to what you had just said, and um, but this is an example of the questions that I want to be able to ask and struggle with asking. And so um, it kind of goes in, goes hand with um, what Pat was saying about the questions, but um, Charlene, you had brought up in your um, agency, a white woman who made a completely asinine comment. And what I struggled with was that, what made it uh, an inappropriately racial comment and not just a completely ignorant human? Does that make sense? Uh, Yes, Um, so, Our whole um, organization is built on living out our values, and we are a Black-led organization, Um, and our majority of our board of directors are Black, and if you're going to be a part of the organization, you, you do have to understand that we are centering Blackness in our work. 
And that may not, because of the nature of our work, we're not a traditional nonprofit. We're not um, just, you know, <laughs> we just, we're just not there. And, and, and the reason we're not a traditional nonprofit is because we want to dismantle some of those notions of what it means to be traditional nonprofit. Um, and, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, the whole nonprofit industrial complex, it's a, it's a thing that we're trying to just not embed in our organization. And so we took a risk by adding to um, white people to our board. And one of the, the person that said that, me, to, that to me was a board member. And the fact that she has not been on board since the beginning, it kind of felt a bit disingenuous for her to really not understand fully what we do. And um, this was not the first run-in <laughs> that we have had. So when she said it to me, when she initially entered the organization, like one of her first meetings was like, she was surprised to see our, our uh, financial statements as if like, did you not expect us to have money? <laughs> like, you know, it was like her, I don't know, her, she has some work to do in, in her own self, but um, I guess what made it, what made it just an ignorant comment versus a, a racially sensitive one was the fact that she felt like she had power over me because she is my, quote, my boss is on my board. And so she felt like she was empowered to say anything to me um, about how the organization should be run. And it almost felt like nitpicking a little bit versus like, so I'm giving you a whole, like, there's a whole lot of backstory I'm not giving you, but in that moment, it, it just felt unnecessary to chastise me about whether a meeting started on time or not versus like, I'm actually doing my job, which is raising money and like, we're good, like as, as an organization, like I'm meeting all of my executive director metrics, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it just felt almost like this. And she was looking for a reason to, again, put me in my place, which is what white people like to do. <laughs> so that's why I felt racially insensitive. And then I'll, can I just add, can I just chime in on this a little bit too? So I, so an experience that I had, and I, and I'm, I'm going to just guess that this is still happening in a county that I used to work with. So whenever we would put out like a, a request for proposals for new contracts, we always had the same organizations um, winning those contracts and they were always run, um, you know, it was a, a, a coming from a white organization and we would have these like startup organizations like you, like Charlene says, and they would be Latino run, they would be uh, African-American run, maybe even, even Asian American Indian and they mm -hmm. never won. And part mm -hmm. of the reason why they never got the contract because they ran their co their company or their organizations in a non-traditional way based yep. on what was a norm for their culture. And exactly. so <laughs> the contract requirements or the re proposal requirements were always coming from what is a structure that that was built on a foundation of a, of a white organization. And so we challenged them, we challenged our own internal administration around, we're never gonna get these, these, these um, ethnic, uh, I guess, based organizations because they're never gonna meet that criteria because they're trying to run their organizations from a mm -hmm. cultural, from their cultural lens. And you're asking them to do it from a white cultural lens and they're never gonna win them. So we had a real, I mean, it was a really hard struggle and it's still a struggle. And, and it's not even just within our organization because within the organization, you also have, where does, where does the money come from? There's the fiscal, yeah. that, mm -hmm. that, that opens a whole other can of worms because then they have their rules and again, from a white lens. And mm -hmm. so it, that is a, that's an example I think of institutional and structural racism and then people will I mean I think this is how this is the way that we interpret it oftentimes the organization would say well we did our part we put it out there for everybody we gave everybody the opportunity to and you just weren't qualified and we would push back and say yes they are qualified they can do the work 
And yes. they can, but they don't meet the criteria that you're asking them to meet. And yeah. so then I think when somebody comes into a situation like the, the one that Charlene just described, who is it doesn't understand where that organization is coming from and then saying that's not acceptable. That was like, to me, when we would turn down all these little organizations, that's what we were telling them. We were telling mm-hmm. them, you no, know, you don't, you're not good enough. Only these white run organizations are good enough because they meet our criteria. You're not good yeah. enough. And so we're not going to give you the money. And when you, when you change and become more like us, then we'll give you the money to run your organization. So, I mean, I feel like that's like the same thing, the same experience that Charlene was having. But I think that's just like how our bureaucracies are all run. And unfortunately, it's so deep that the, the, um, the, those traditions, those are the foundations about how our, our, a lot of our organizations are built are so deep. It's really mm-hmm. hard to dismantle it's us. It's so deep, yeah. We can open it up so that other people have access to the things that generally have been more, like they've been more accommodating to, you know, white organizations. Yep. Ooh, you, you, ooh, that was such a great example, um, Roxanne. I, I've seen that here happen too in Nashville when it comes to awarding um, contracts. Um, case in point with the Our Fair Share initiative that I, I spoke about with the COVID uh, money, we were awarded a $500,000 contract from the city to do the needs assessment, whereas we actually asked for $2 million to do the needs assessment. And when they came back and started awarding out the money, they did it in such a way where they, they designated nonprofit organizations and institutions to be dispersed out to be the grant administrators. Well, we had issue with that because it was like, where was the process on how did you all pick these organizations? And they were all white led, like established organizations. Um, For example, the United Way, which nothing against the United Way, but it was like these big box nonprofits that always got awarded the money. And we're like over here, like, but where the, if we're saying, give the money to black and Latino communities, where are the black and Latino organizations that know their communities best giving out the money? <laughs> and uh, they were like, well, we didn't think, and this was literally from their mouths, uh, one of the task force members, well, we just didn't think you all had the infrastructure to handle this type of money. What? Like, did you, even, you didn't even ask us if we had the capacity. Like we just did a $500,000 needs assessment in four weeks. What? <laughs> So it's that kind of like bias that really irks me when it comes to um, how money trickles down from government too. Uh, But what I was going to also say about that is something I learned about was having, and this is what I I challenge you all to have in your organization is SMARTY goals. I don't know if you all have heard about SMARTY goals. Um, Instead of having SMART goals, SMARTY goals, S-M-A-R-T. IE. So the IE um, stands for having inclusive goals and having an equity lens attached to it. So with your example, Roxanne, they could have easily said, okay, yeah, we, well, we put it out there for, for folks to get the money, but then they could have also said, well, we're going to earmark 20% to um, go towards you know, Latinx organizations that would have been, um, and having an equity lens toward it, but they didn't do that, I guess. But yeah, like having, um, making sure that the work that you all are doing is um, inclusive and equitable, um, even on down to like, who is making these decisions? Are we bringing people who are the most impacted to the table um, to to be making these decisions for uh, marginalized communities? Yeah. All right. Um, all right. Reading the comments. Yeah, we need to have these conversations a lot more. I'm I'm enjoying this. Hope y'all are too. Um uh feel responsive on each of us. Yep, was definitely on us for a long time. We felt we were all different against each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, we can do better wine for sure. Okay. Um I don't have anything else unless you all have other questions or Charlie, I just want to ask you a burning question. 
I put a question, mm-hmm. a comment. I just want to ask about the, you know, the white board member. Like, why did you feel the need to add a white uh, board member, or was it a conscious decision, or that you just have to know that person? A little bit of both. Um, well, yeah, knew her. Uh, she started out as a volunteer, so she's in our sort of way we do. We we like to uh, promote from within, and she's she sh- shown herself approved and. But she also, she's a white Jewish woman who has access to resources and we wanted that on our board. Um, so, but perhaps may have, we probably could have done a bit more better vetting on that, but um, yeah. <laughs> Just wanted. Yeah. Great woman though, she's a great woman. Just, you know, we all have flaws. And so I want to circle back up and if I don't want to hog the conversation, but again, we, you know, we're new in South Carolina to TCOM and doing the cast and fan McCann's mm-hmm. and fast. And so um, I do kind of want to talk about, you know, any suggestions you may have. It, it sounds like to me, there may need to be some training. So I'm wondering if you do public speaking, if you'll come and speak to us and our, and our team about how to coach people through that process and also keep in mind what culturally responsive actually looks like. Right now, it is just a term thrown out there in our GPS model to guide us through our practice. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people understand it, but I think a lot of people don't understand it. So I think it needs to be where we get below that layer of what does culturally responsive mean and what it looks like and what it's not, right? Because if we're gonna be having these meaningful conversations with families and like someone said earlier, digging into their past, we have to come from a you know perspective of not being biased, right? And hearing their stories and then tr- trying to figure out how we can connect them with services to empower them to be better and can reconnect their families. Mm-hmm. So we want to talk about that. How do we use this subject of race and racial divide and racial inequality? And how do we transfer that over into meaningful conversations in our work? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just like we're doing right now. I mean, we just gotta. I guess I'm being I'm being selfish. Meaning, in South Carolina, how can you come? Because oh. <laughs> we're gonna have to have someone have this conversation. Okay. Well, I can. Uh... And it can't be Lasagna. It can't be me because I don't come from a gotcha. fully educated about it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can give you my email address if you want to talk offline <laughs> uh, about that for sure. Um, Yeah, sometimes it takes like a third party to get the point across, almost like my husband, like if he he has to hear somebody else say it instead of me, uh, for him to believe it. I think I've all been there. (laughs) (laughs) Even my children sometimes. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. Um, Any other burning questions? Like, I hope this is a safe space. So if you feel like you want to ask a question that you've always wanted to ask, but couldn't or felt kind of weird about, like feel free um, to ask that if you need to. Um, I, I wrote down another comment about someone said, I don't, I don't see color. Um, you know, that's, that's one we hear a lot. Um, I don't see color. And I would just challenge, challenge you to, uh, you know, change your vocabulary in that, uh, because we're, we, we're all like, we all have color. <laughs> and um, to say, I don't see color dismisses a, a bit of my humanity actually. And you don't see me actually. Um, for who I am in, in all of my, my, my black skin that I cannot change. I cannot take it off. And um, so I, I would definitely challenge you to say, I, I see you, like I see you. Um, and uh, it, it feels good to be seen. Like I said all the time on Facebook, I, I feel seen. Like <laughs> somebody said something I agree with, I feel seen. So uh, yeah, it, that is that is definitely a triggering comment that can feel very insensitive um, towards certain folks. And Charlene, I, I think I'm the one that said that because that's something that um, I think I grew up 
thinking that was the right thing to do to kind of just accept everyone as who they are. There's no color. Everyone's equal. And I think with what's been going on in the world lately, recognizing that I was wrong and I am wrong and, and how to change that perspective has been eye opening for me and really just learning that like mm-hmm. that I'm wrong. Gotcha. Saying that my whole life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's OK. Like. It's OK. <laughs> and now we just move forward and uh, do better. We just you know, we do better. So. Absolutely. Uh, okay. I think that's one of the things that 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 um, leads to racism is that people don't. It's about acceptance. So not saying that, that you know I don't see color. It's seeing color and seeing differences and being okay with that. It's not we don't want you to not see you know the difference, but just being okay that we're all different. We're individual human beings. We all have our own culture and being okay with that. And, and when you you're not okay with that when you're saying that, you know, my culture is better than yours or, you know, my beliefs are better than yours, then that is what excludes people and, you know, leads to racism and division. And I think, you know, Mm -hmm. with with Lori's question, you know, it it was her thought that it was racist because it was her way of running her meetings were um, not sufficient for her because it wasn't ran the way she likes them to be ran, which is the way a system that was set up by white people. So if it's not done that way, the way white people do it, the way that white people you know, initially set it up, then it's wrong. And that's what makes it racist. It might be different, but it doesn't make it wrong. And so that's where the issue comes in when Absolutely. people think that their difference is, is superior to someone else. And it's not, it's really about acceptance. We just have to accept who each other, each other are, our cultures, you know, our beliefs and values and be okay with that. And I think that's the same with treating our children. A lot of times we have to tell the clinicians, you know, they have these biases or these, you know, why they don't understand how you can go to a house and, you know, they got a car with rims on it in the yard, but yet have no food, you know, in the refrigerator. So they, they don't understand the difference and why that is. They don't understand like, well, I got it together. Why couldn't they just get it together? They don't mm-hmm. understand the lack of resources that are in these neighborhoods that they just can't magically get it together. Some of us, you know, I've, I've had, I grew up in Watts, like Los Angeles Watts. And so I had, didn't come from a good home, you know, it was during the eighties with the crack, it was terrible. And so, but I just was fortunate that, you know, I've always had an olive branch extended to me, not from family members, just from somebody, you know, getting to know me and wanting to help me. And, and that's how, you know, I was able to make it out. But um, just asking, you know, what are their values? You know, because when we go into homes, we have our own personal values on how I, I raise my children. That may not be their values. You know, what's important to you? What that's how you empower the families by asking them what's important to you. What 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 how do you discipline? What is your discipline style? What are your values? Because before you try to change something in the home, you have to understand what it mm-hmm. is that they believe in. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it, it's the same thing when we go into homes, just you know, offering these interventions and these solutions. We haven't even asked them like, what's wrong. We we just look and see what we think is wrong because of you know what our beliefs are. Um, and so we start offering these things that is offensive. Like what makes you think I need that? I didn't you know can tell you I need right. that. So it is about just you know accepting, getting to know others and accepting who they are and what their values and beliefs are, and not putting them down for it. You know the, the meeting is yes. is not sufficient for her because it's not ran her way. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great, great points, Barbara. Um, celebrating those differences and and immersing ourselves in other people's cultures. Like, it, let's not. I think that also where we go wrong is we tend to get our we we get our information from media and TV of what of what we think certain cultures are supposed to be doing, and um, that reinforces those stereotypes. But like, when's the last time we actually like? went to a place, physical place where we're in the minority and we immerse ourselves in someone else's culture and just was in it, you know, Um, in Nashville, there's a, there's a place called Plaza Mariachi um, in South Nashville. And it's like this huge shopping center um, gathering place in the middle of the the building. It's, it's this huge open area. It's got a stage and all around it's got shops and it's, 
it's all the Latin American types of uh, restaurants. You can get all kinds of like food there and they have like salsa night. And, you know, sometimes we go and just hang out and it's totally okay, but they're doing them. They just, they, they're being free and joyful and that's their culture. And so I challenge folks to just get outside their comfort zone again going back to past said, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable and going to spaces where we are not the majority all the time to learn and break down some of those preconceived notions that we have about other cultures in an effort to, um, you know, dismantle some of those stereotypes. Um, hi, and I'd like to add also, um, you know, even with our own children, uh, just the importance of the cultural identity development at an early age. Um, I had this experience with my daughter. Um, I'll, I'll date myself. My daughter's 22, 23. Um, I had her at 15, so <laughs> you could do the math. I'm not that old. <laughs> but um, also, you know what I think early on, uh, I want. I did. I also didn't bring up you know, uh, race or ethnicity at such an early age. But when she went to daycare um, at three, she came home and asked me, what is Mexican? And I said, um, oh, why? You know, and we live in Southern California. You think it's pretty diverse. She said that because a girl in her class with yellow hair told her that she was not American. She was Mexican. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, at three or four years old, we had to have that conversation. And so uh, prior to that experience, I think I, uh, I assumed it was something that was going to be discussed later on. Um, but after that, uh, with my second child, we, you know, early on, I started helping develop his sense of cultural identity. And I think that's something that we can apply in our personal lives, as well as, as with our clients, exploring you know, what does culture mean to them and help empower them and help them strengthen their cultural identity. So when they do encounter these uh, discriminations or things like that, they, they um, you know, they're educated they, and they, they don't take that, the negative stereotypes that are being fed to them. Yep. Great point, great point. Hey, Charlene. Mm -hmm. This is Kathy Gracie and I just want to say amazing work. You are so inspiring. Your, <laughs> your morning lecture was wonderful. And I apologize for coming in late. I was on another Zoom. But my question is, and it might have already been asked, and if it has, I apologize. Um, so we are working with, in, within DCS um, and partnering with DCS. And they, they have a they've started a disproportionate minority work group. And if you were to think about system level intervention and you're, you've coalesced a group of leaders together to, to address or look at that or even study it, what would be your advice, like top three things to um, move a system that might um, have disproportionate disproportionality within the system. And this is within DCS. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, well, one, I, I would question who's going to be on the work group. Um, what's the makeup of who is who is there? Um, I, I always champion like the person who is closest to the problem needs to be at the table. So who is, and it's not always the senior level staffer. It's, it yeah. could be, it's yeah. the, the home visitor, you know, that person, like someone who knows what's going on on the ground um, should definitely be on those, in those work groups. Um, I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to say without more details, but I would also maybe look at just revisit your processes like um, from the lens of the client, the, the person, like how are they interfacing with your organization and are there like blind spots 
um, that could make them feel that could be harmful to that person because it's not culturally responsive or it's not um, uh, making them feel as human as they could. Uh, I hate going to like doctor's offices where I just feel like it's an assembly line and I just feel like I'm a number. Like, let's make sure we still humanize the process of how we do service delivery. Um, Sherilyn, can I just yeah. can I just like throw something in there? It's like something that you said earlier. Mm -hmm. Rather than looking at through a lens of disproportionality, look at it through a lens of equity. Mm -hmm. Because here's what I'm, I'm gonna because I've been I've worked on disproportionality again, like practically my oh, whole really? career, and it's never it it continues to exist as much work as we put into try to lower the numbers and the rates. They never go down. In fact, I think they continue to go up. Because the, the problem is, is that the child welfare system and the juvenile probation system and the criminal justice system and the welfare system, all those systems, they are, they're only, they only serve the people that are sent to them. them. And yeah. so you start with the population that you have that, that they get called on, right? Yeah. And these are people that are over policed, over monitored, who have fewer, um, I, I, I'd say poor experiences in the education system. So those are the ones that come to our attention. And, and if they continue to be over police and over monitored, they are gonna continue to come to our door. And so that's the population that you're working with. So you don't have control of who comes to your door, but once they're in your door, then how are they being treated? And that's where equity comes into, into play. So they have to have equal respect. They have to have, their voice has to really be heard Mm -hmm. All of those things. Mm -hmm. If you want to impact disproportionality, you have to look outside the system. It's yeah. not going to happen in the system. It just isn't. It's just, I'm just putting that out there because I've been working on this issue for many, many years and people keep trying to attack it from within the system and it doesn't work because you don't have control over who comes to your system. Right. So you have to tackle it from police, from the school system, from the medical uh, systems, especially the county. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Except yeah, yeah. A lot, like you said, a lot of these people come into your system at their most lowest moments, and you know where, you know where all the the poverty intersections are the worst. And like, how do we not make them feel they're they're already distrusting of government because all of these systems and are telling them what to do. They're talking at them. How do you make them feel like they have power over their own solution? And it gets back to like restorative justice. I don't know if people are familiar with like the restorative justice process, but can can they have more autonomy over their own like? plan for success um yeah like get is is there a way to like change that and not have a one size fits all solution to every person like that's not equity that's again going back to the whole equality thing we're trying to slap a band-aid on everybody when everybody don't need a band-aid like what is their individualized plan for success and making them feel like they have a say or giving them a say truly in that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we are Brands at up. time, everybody. Oh, I know, Charlene, you didn't think you had anything <laughs> to say. And look at that. Uh, look, we went two hours. Look at that. We did two hours straight, no breaks. Yes, I, I promise y'all, I did not have an agenda for it. <laughs> I told you it's Lucy Goosey, <laughs> but it's always good. Oh, yeah. good. So, well, I hope that was helpful, fruitful. Give me feedback, um, you know, positive or negative, and let me know. Um, and I'll drop my email if anybody wants to chat further or has questions that they don't feel comfortable talking about here. And uh, yeah, I'm here in Nashville out here trying to build independent political power for black communities and I'll do that as long as the Lord let me. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank and you. Um, put your thank yous in the chat box for Charlene to read and then I'm going to share my screen so if you guys are playing that game you can get the word. <laughs>